the co-presenter, Sarah Fry, um, but due to a number of personal and professional obligations, she can't be with us today. So um, flexibility is the name of the game this year, isn't it? So we're, we're going to carry on. Um, it means that this is going to be a little bit more of an interactive discussion, but I think that's going to work well because it's walking the talk in, um, in uh, relying on, on participants' um, knowledge uh, as, as, as a driving force in, in what we're aiming for. Um, now, I met uh, Sarah Fry as we were teaching a class for Boise State called University Foundations. And this is University Foundations 200, which looked at um, learning outcomes in ethics and diversity. And we could choose what lens we wanted to look at. And so the title of my class was um, uh, creating community in a post-truth era, because I'm a librarian. So I was looking at information literacy. Sarah Fry had taught the class for a couple of years before I started, so she was a mentor to me. And we were in a small group that got together to talk about the difficulties inherent on in trying to teach on such potentially sensitive topics. And one of the articles that we um, came across that I'd like to share with you um, was uh, Denial's Pedagogy of Kindness. And that became very much um, a driver in, in um, our discussions, in our reading, and in our um, what we tried in the classroom. I'm going to give you a link here in the chat box to the um, resources that we were looked at in our discussion so that you can maybe follow along with some of those. Let me know if you can't access them for some reason. Hopefully I set up the link properly so anybody with it can get in there and view. So um, the pedagogy of kindness by denial was a really a driving factor. And I'm seeing in this conference that it is definitely a theme. As I'm looking at the titles and participating, I'm seeing that for um, for most of us, kindness, compassion, empathy, flexibility were really keys to um, to our, our our conducting our classes this session and and maintaining some balance. Yeah. So we are going to use a tool, and you can see it in my screen up here. It is one option for your participation called annotate. If you haven't used it before, you might take a look right now. I think you can see it looks like a little pencil. And on PCs, it's usually up in the top. It may be down below for you. It may be in the view options. If you're using a Chromebook, you will not have that option, I'm afraid. But it can be a lot of fun because once you click on it, then you can um, add text to whatever we're looking at. You can draw, you can stamp. So these are options for participation in our session today. And it, there you go, somebody's given it a try already. <laughs> um, so, and it's, it's a way to kind of um, do it a little more anonymously than chat. So, so let's practice it with the next, next slide. Let's see if I can get it, get it to go. Uh -huh. Come on, come on, my slides. Let's see if I could do this. Come on. All of a sudden, <laughs> I'm going to get out of there. Come on. There we go. Okay. So, some more practice. Which Yoda image describes your feelings today? So, you can go into annotate or you can respond in chat, whichever makes the most sense for you. Got a lot of folks that are feeling unsure and hopeful, tired. Yeah, I have to admit that that I'm feeling a little bit that way too. Thrilled, yay, somebody's very happy. Um, you might know, I have used this slide before. Um, I used it at the beginning of my course this fall to ask folks, how do you feel about participating in remote learning? Um, 
and just to get gauge their response. And then at the very end, I use the slide again and I ask them, all right, after our experience together, how do you feel about remote learning? And it was a really wonderful way to, um, to see the differences. It was a wonderful, easy and engaging assessment technique that seemed to work for us. Okay. So thank you for your participation there. I'm going to erase it all before, before we um, do clear them all. Okay, come on, clear, clear. Clear all drawing. There we go. Okay. And then I got to remember to get out. So my next question for you that I hope you will answer, you can respond in chat or here is academic rigor. What words do you associate with the term academic rigor? And again, you're welcome to use the annotate tool. You can, you can write your response here or you can write in chat. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Flexible, hard. Stress. Busy work, high expectations. The bar. Subjective. Challenging. Mm -hmm. High expectations. So clearly a gamut of, of terms. Does anybody want to expand on their response? open up their mic and, and talk about. Well, the fact is it's, um, it's a difficult term to describe and it is subject to differences of ideas. Ideas of rigor are different um, within inst institutions, within departments, um, yeah. It, they change a lot for us. And um, research that we looked at said that student perceptions of rigor change um, through their academic careers. Often, especially in uh, high school or maybe the first year of college, they think of rigor in terms of workload. How much time is it going to take me to do this? But as their academic career, the same research found that their perceptions often change to learning, cognitive load, how much is it going to take me to learn this material? That same research found that at times in some classes and perhaps in, in well-managed classes, students had the perception of easy and, and hard in terms of rigor at the same time. The, con the concepts that they were supposed to learn were difficult, but the way that those concepts were approached through the curriculum and the classroom atmosphere made it easy, okay? So we can look at those in both two, ter two terms. For many of us, um, we, think of, um, we think of rigor in terms of cognitive load, of critical thinking, right? Of, of getting them, we might use Bloom's taxonomy. Whoops, and I have to erase that. <laughs> right, we're trying to get our students from down here, remembering simple facts, up to this top level where they're taking information, evaluating it, creating something, analyzing it. Um, for many of us, when we're, we're thinking of rigor, we use these bottom tiers, whoops, for our um, formative assessments, right? When we're giving them the vocabulary, teaching them how to read in a discipline, um, how to understand what we want from them and trying to get them up here. Okay. But for, for many of us, um, we have some ideas of rigor that can kind of get in our way. And Nelson called it dysfunctional illusion of rigor. And it's kind of based on these traditional notions of hierarchies in classroom. You know, I am the expert and you are the learners. 
But now um, you'll see on that um, reference list that I gave you, a lot of folks are writing about how um, we need to think a little bit differently in terms of rigor. Um, that it can be, as some of you noted, it can be exclusionary if we if we adhere to traditional notions of rigor. Um, so, um, and Nelson spoke to how uh, many of the practices that he he thought that grading had to be hard and fast, deadlines had to be hard and fast, lectures were okay. That's how he got through his educational experience. So lectures and that students would come to our classes fully prepared to engage. They'd have all the reading and writing skills they need. And so he could move forward. Um, if you look at that article, that's the Nelson article, he has the seven dysfunctional illusions of rigor. And for, for a lot of researchers, um, there's kind of still some arguments going back and forth that, um, that inclusionary practices are at odds with rigor. And I'd like to argue that we can have inclusive classrooms that are also rigor, that we still have high standards, but those standards are accessible to all, okay? So let me ask you about your practices in your classroom and let's talk about how they can be used to um, set high standards, to help our students achieve them and to be inclusive so that our classes are rigorous. So which of these practices have tried? Have you tried in your classrooms? And you can use the annotate tool or respond in, in chat, peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, limited lectures, formative work as rehearsal, so maybe not so high stakes, student-led activities, and choice of assignments. Great. It looks like peer-to-peer -peer learning. Yep, and I'm seeing that show up in chat, student-led. So I would love to hear about your experiences in peer-to-peer -peer learning, the good, the bad. Yeah, if someone would be so brave as to speak up, that looks like a popular one. You guys are, are, sad, are <laughs> some of my classes. <laughs> Does anybody want to speak up about their experiences in peer-to-peer -peer learning? You can't unmute yourselves. Oh dear. This is Kevin, the moderator. The setting says you can. Nobody can unmute. Try, somebody try. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> I'm going to stop the share. Does that make it any easier? Mm -hmm. Well, poop. I guess you're going to be hearing a lot from me. <laughs> that is weird. Mine the works thing... now. Yeah. Okay. There we go. It's something. Somebody did something. Okay. Now, if I if I share the screen again, can you still? Yeah, should be able to. No wonder we were all so quiet, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's such a huge relief. Uh oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we had a lot had a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning um, stamps. People spoke to that. So um, how did your peer-to-peer -peer learning go? What did you do? Well, I'll go ahead and say something, but I don't know if it's what you're referring to, but. Um, I'm I, glad you said that because I didn't define it, define it on purpose. <laughs> um, I think of peer-to-peer -peer learning as just getting the students to talk to each other about the work they're doing. So I teach math and, and I do a lot of things where I encourage them to explain to each other what they think they should do, how they should do it, um, if that's the right way. You know, that's just kind of stuff. I say it's really good if you talk about it. You know, that's how you learn, that kind of thing. Okay, so discussion groups. Yeah. yeah, me too. 
I do that a lot myself. Um, one of the assignments that I've had a lot of luck in is doing a peer review on their final paper. They are to bring a few pages of a rough draft and then they read each other's papers and they need to sit down with them and say, here's what I saw, here's some things you could improve on. And I tell them it's fine to say that they thought something was great, but don't be too kind if you want to call it that because they're going to turn them into me and I'm not necessarily kind when it comes to the grading. So now is the time to help them with everything from are the proper ideas there to grammar and punctuation to, <laughs> you know, the whole thing. And it's been a really good activity. It did not translate as well to online this last year as it was when we could do it as an in-class activity, but we're working on how to get that to work. Okay, yeah. Well, I set up um, small groups and I, I started doing that in, in my face-to-face -face classes, my mixed class, and then most recently in my remote. And students have consistently in my evaluation said those set groups that they could maintain throughout the semester were one of the most valuable things for them because it engendered some trust. And that is also a factor that I found is really important in, these day, in this day and age in being able to, to move forward with our learning. Um, how about formative work as rehearsal? What, what did that mean for some of you stamp that one? Um, I have a thing that I do. I teach writing and composition courses. And so when I introduce an essay, we write three essays throughout the semester. Um, I have weekly assignments that are due that take students through the writing process. Um, so for the first assignment, they have to analyze a piece of writing. So they need to summarize it and respond. And so then throughout the whole week, they comment on each other's stuff um, in small groups. And then they turn that in and I grade it as complete or incomplete. Did you meet all the assignment requirements or not? Um, and then they have opportunities to resubmit all of that formative work up until their essay is due. So if I read through and I give them um, feedback on those assignments, but I found that not only does it help them help me get better, I don't like that word, but help me get a good papers out of them um, by the time papers that meet assignment, assignment requirements, but it also kind of gives them that step-by-step work as they're building on their essays and writing them throughout the course set. That's low stakes. Um, and I, I just say, if you get completes on all your assignments and they're submitted by the by the time your essay is due, then um, we'll be able to work together to revise your essay if you, if you are unhappy with how the essay went. But that's something that I've been doing this semester. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, some of the research that we saw, saw referred to it as rehearsal or just experimentation or play. I even thought, so So it's this idea of taking these new concepts and, and yeah, um, I did that in that um, they had to do reflections on the readings that they get, that they did. And that was preparation for discussions, which then led to more serious. So um, student led activities. Anybody wanna share student led activities? Did you make your your students responsible for any of the curriculum? No. Okay. This is these are all all some way, ways of getting our getting our students up to their cognitive skills, engaging engaging and moving up to those high standards. Limited lectures. Or in the case of my colleague, Sarah Fry, she still did lectures, but she also provided, she recorded the lectures and she also provided the, um, the uh, slides and notes so that students always had access to refer to them. So they had multiple modes. Um, and I found that that's important too. Choice of assignments, multiple modes. My students didn't just have to write a, write um, write a paper on something. They could also create an infographic with citations, or they could do an interview or presentation with citations. So choices of assignments were were also some. These are some great ways to get that active learning going, and that that is an important. Active learning connections to real world problems or um, and connections to student knowledge, ha um, recognizing that they are coming to the class with, um, with some knowledge already and recognizing that knowledge and giving them a chance to, um, to use it in class. All right, do-overs. 
Here's another one that you can either, either do an annotate or chat. Should students get a second chance at exams and other assignments? And I didn't just make it a yes, no. I, I gave you a, a spectrum of answers because I realized that many of these ideas are, are not yes, no. And suddenly I cannot see chat. There it is, we got some chat responses. Okay, I'm grateful that there are no, no, no ways. <laughs> and lots of this middle ground. Can somebody speak to why you put it in the middle between absolutely and no way? Uh oh, can we not unmute? Um, I have a thought I'll share. My name's Shaylin. Um, mm -hmm. In the courses I teach, I find that it kind of depends on the assignment. Like each week I give low stakes quizzes that students get a second chance or a do over on. Um, but then things like the midterm exam, they only get one attempt because if they've been doing those low stakes quizzes, they should be then prepared for that because the midterm is based on that information we've been learning at the beginning of the semester. So I think it kind of depends on um, the experience and maybe what you're hoping the outcomes are for your students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I found too. Um, that And it also, when I went to, when, one of the reasons I would give people another chance is if I looked at the assignment and see that they did not understand the objective. That, yeah, and so that was another reason that I would offer people a, a second chance at, at assignments. Because um, a lot of the research finds that one of the major hurdles for a lot of students is just understanding stu uh, teacher expectation. Um, and so the clarity of our instructions is, is really important. Um, explicit instructions, ex, um, alignment of our objectives and our assignments, and being explicit about that alignment, the whys of what we're doing, is so essential in this day and age. Um, some researchers recommend over explaining. Um, yeah. Any other comments on do overs? All right. Our next one is, let's get rid of our, our clear, clear all drawings. Okay. Oh, and I, I missed Sally Rock's um, chat note. Second chance is okay, but they don't always get all the points. Okay, grading. Here's another sticking point for, for standards. Um, have you tried any of these peer assessments, improvement as a metric, the immediate feedback technique, student self-assessment, some of you are, or dropping the worst scores? I like how Kevin referred to dropping a low score as life happens token. <laughs> I think that's one of the easiest, easiest ways to, to give our students a break is dropping those worst scores, isn't it? Um, and, and it's that choice again, offering some choice um, and flexibility. So any comments about your responses? Yeah, this is Kevin on my life happens tokens. Uh, I got this idea from a, another faculty. 
Um, but what I've done is, you know, my I say that assignments aren't accepted late, and that's mainly to keep students on task, and I've experimented with that over the years. But what I'll tell them is you have a life happens token, and um, if you can't get it in by the deadline, you can turn it in late, up to a week late, and cash in a life happens token, and then I give them um, up to half the points. So they can, you know, they're still need to do the work, but it gives them an option to still give some points. Mm -hmm. What's also funny about it is it's in the syllabus mm -hmm. is where I state it. And um, I can tell you that some students don't find it, even though it stands out pretty well in my mind, because my syllabus is very short. I found when I do peer assessments that students are harder on each other than I would be. Um, for at least one of the assignments, we do peer assessments, and I and I give I give half the points according to the peers and half according to mine, and I include some of the peer comments um, when I give folks the grades. Um, and the immediate feedback technique, it is it is a technique I can. If I can. And it's, it involves a kind of a scratch off method of approaching tests. It's a multiple choice using scratch offs. And there was a session just in the last hour about this. Um, what I think of immediate feedback, I think of just um, responding to student performance very quickly after their performances not just in the grade, but reaching out to them in email. And so I did that a lot since my course is very discussion based. Um, and there's a sequence where they have to read, reflect in writing, um, discuss in small groups, discuss as a class. So there I have three opportunities to, to look at how the student is doing and to let them know right away in an email, I noticed you didn't reflect on the reading. And so that affected your performance in, in the discussion group. What's going on? How can I help you keep on target with your learning? Um, and also to, you know, give them three cheers when I really noticed that they were being a facilitator in their small group, that they were adding a lot to our discussions. That was my idea of immediate feedback um, to try and respond to at least um, at least four students a week to give them immediate res um, responses on their on how they were doing in class. Improvement as a metric, I am very curious. I have not tried that. Um, it involves some pre and post testing. Um, can anybody speak to that? Cree is talking about how she tries to give students lots of opportunities to revise and rethink. Um, yeah, and let's talk about deadlines. If anybody has no other comments here. Okay, the next one is deadlines. I'm going to clear all the drawings here. And we're going to move into looking at deadlines, which some of you have talked about already. How strict are you with deadlines? And Cree kind of mentioned this by the due date. So there's this balance of not accepting late work, but uh, okay, strict deadlines, what deadlines? Marks less strict during COVID, okay. <laughs> less strict during, during COVID. Yeah, Preston makes a great comment. Depends on the circumstances, as with most things, doesn't it? And it depends on the course level. All right. Lots of folks in the middle ground. Anybody want to speak to their responses?
I have seen students get burned on the idea of, oh, I don't have to meet deadlines because yes, at times the world will get you off the hook, but many times it won't. And so I will look somewhat at a case by case basis if students will email me and say why they missed it or what they need, but I hold to fairly strict deadlines. I think it's just a good life skill to learn. Okay. Beth, we have five minutes. Okay. So I have to admit in my um, formative assessments, strict deadlines because they're scaffolded, right? They're, they're building up to something. Um, but I, I offer lots and lots of extra credit um, that folks that I'm flexible with. I do not, and I talking with Sarah and other peers, I do not want to leave it open until the end of the semester because we have to be kind to ourselves too. And we have to think about equitable um, yeah, and it's also, we're, we have a little bit of pressure from our peers too, to, to have deadlines. Yeah. So I have a balance. Um, I did afford my students opportunities to turn in the, the summative assessments, the biggies that were worth more points late, but they had to communicate with me beforehand and we had to negotiate. I told them, how much time do you want? I didn't set a certain amount of days. I, I wanted them to engage in the process and tell me they couldn't have until the end of the semester, but they could have additional time, but they had to talk with me because communication is so key. And here we are in the last one. And let's just talk about this one rather than how, how do you encourage students to ask for help when they need it? And this is so key. Okay, seeing mandatory emails and mandatory office hours. Well, self-regulated learners, according to the research, have a, an array of skills that not all of our students have. These cognitive competencies of understanding when they need help and knowing when to reach out. And there's also this idea of trust. Um, there's idea, and many of our first generation students or folks from different backgrounds, underrepresented students face stereotype threats. So it all kind of adds up to, we need to foster their trust. And here are some simple ways to make, make them think that, make them understand that we're on their side. Language, I'm really glad to see that there was a session about using student names and isn't Zoom wonderful for that. Language in your syllabus, your announcements, your assignments. We, us, our. It is our class. It is not your work. It is our work. We are doing it together. That is something I learned way back when that I've used ever since. And I think it's important. Um, grading systems, collaborative activities, um, anything to help earn their trust can help students believe that when they reach out for help, we're there for them. Um, and Shaylin's talking about, she takes a few minutes to talk with students on an individual basis and check in. Yeah, break down the hidden curriculum and let them know they matter. One minute. Well, thank you for your patience as we work through our technical difficulties and my lack of a, of a um, co-presenter. I appreciate your patience and hope the rest of your semester goes well. Um, you can reach out to me. I'm going to get rid of the annotate. Here's the contact information for me or my colleague. Um, yeah. And I hope you feel like I tried to walk the talk here a little bit in our presentation um, and build on your knowledge, make you feel like you're included in the process and let you know I care. Thank you for all the good work you're doing. And we'll see you in the other sessions. Great job, Beth. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh, I was nervous when Sarah had to drop out because I didn't have a lot of time. So. <laughs> well, I 
thought that went well. Thanks. These are shorter sessions too. It's kind of like how Instructure Canvas does their conference. They keep them, the sessions shorter, you know, and it, they, time does fly fast. You find out it does. It really did. I was worried about filling it. So thank All you right. very much for your help today, Kevin. Let me stop the recording.